Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, as Labor Day weekend arrives, the state makes a push to keep COVID at bay. You know, there are just some things that we have to give up for a year and big family gatherings, probably gonna be one of them. Plus the line on racial tension and the controversial voice of a Lobo legend. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Now that racial tension I spoke of just a moment ago when the show opened came to a head courtesy of former UNM football player Brian Urlacher and his displeased descendants on the Lobo gridiron. The line we'll discuss. We'll also sit down with a familiar face as Laura Pascas talks to us about her new book, At the Precipice. We'll start with the line in a homeless state agency. There's no love lost between Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and the Public Re Regulation Commission, no doubt on that. Over the first two lawmaking sessions of her term, she and legislators crafted a shutdown plan for the San Juan Generating Station that stepped on a few toes. She's supporting a constitutional amendment to turn the PRC, the Public Regulation Commission, into an appointed position rather than the elected one it is now. Now, she's flexed her muscle by having another state agency evict the PRC from its headquarters in downtown Santa Fe, and that's where we'll begin our line opinion panel. Joining us today is frequent guest, Crystal Ciarza. She's president and CEO of, uh, president and owner, I should say, of Ciarza Social Digital. Sorry, Crystal. Serge Martinez is with us. We're so glad to have a former state rep with us as well, and that would be local attorney Justine Fox Young. She's back with us. Now, Justine, We'll get into the PRC's lengthy list of miscues, missteps, and crimes in a minute. But first, office space. The agency still has to do the work it's been given in the state law, in state law, and the Constitution. Why the eviction? Right. I mean, why? It's a petty and um, I think very wrongheaded move on the part of the governor. You've mm -hmm. got something like 120 employees who are working from home. Um, I'm not sure how regulators are supposed to to do their jobs mm -hmm. in that kind of environment. If the pandemic would end tomorrow, these folks would still be working from home. They have nowhere to meet, nowhere to keep their files, right. um, no, nowhere to conduct business. And it's, it's totally insane. I think um, two things happened from what I can tell that have really set the governor off. One is some members of the PRC picked a fight with her over the San Juan generating station. So difference of opinion in, in how to proceed and then secondly, she's pushing the constitutional amendment. I think the great irony is if you disable this agency mm -hmm. and, and prevent them from doing the, a lot of pretty critical work that the agency does, even if she gets her constitutional amendment, you know, how do you make this place work? You have to have a working entity at that point. And um, I understand the governor is shaking down all kinds of left-wing groups and, you know, renewable energy um, entities in support of uh, the constitutional amendment. But the problem is those are, those are some of the same sort of good government folks who, who really do want to see this place work. They want to see regulators be able to do their jobs. And my, my biggest concern is that the consumer gets screwed in all of this because there's nobody watching. And, you just hit and, a point right there. Yeah, I, I appreciate you just saying that. Let me turn to Serge on this. Serge, we're talking about good government here. And the PRC regulates all kinds of things that affect everyday New Mexicans every day, if you get my drift. It's not a 30,000 foot policy shop. It's a direct, this is what, in, you know, your wallet, your, your health, everything. What's in the sense of good government? Is this good government? I mean, what, are we being served here as taxpayers? I mean, I don't think so. I agree with Christine. It seems like mm -hmm. a petty and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, not, it's a move that can backfire in the sense of this is not, I mean, this is a constitutionally created, uh, organ, you know, part of our government. They do, as you say, like, the more I learn about it, the more I'm surprised at how, how many things are affected by, by the work of the PRC. Uh, and I think, you know, the crippling of it or hobbling it or just, you know, being annoying to it is not going to serve any of us, any of us well and scoring, you know, relatively cheap points uh, 
off of them. And, and, you know, I get it. This, you know, this organization is not without lots of dysfunction and lots of, you know, historically and lots of, lots of uh, uh, its own missteps. But I think taking this up moment to try to really, you know, to punish them is not going to, it's not going to help New Mexicans uh, and it's not going to help our state, you know, deal with all of the, the, the boring stuff that really makes a, a government run. Mm -hmm. Crystal, interestingly, when you think about this, the PRC got notice of this in March, uh, but they didn't get any money from anybody. General Services Department says there's no space anywhere. It just seems very undone. I'm curious why there wasn't money let out maybe during the special session. They could have dealt with it then. I, I just something seems off here. What's your sense of it? Oh, absolutely. Something seems off, you know, and for as long as I've been on New Mexico and focus, I've really tried to avoid the conversation of the PRC simply <laughs> put because it's so difficult to understand exactly all that they do. And, you know, in, in terms of running, you know, you know, running a business, right. If you see the lines of you didn't pay your rent, you get evicted as soon as I read that as the, as in, within the first paragraph of the story from, I believe it was the Santa Fe New Mexican that, that talked about it in depth. If you don't pay your rent, you don't get to stay in the building, right? They're not and required if, to pay rent. Well, if, according to the story, that's what, that, that's what um, was specifically over there. So as a business owner, when you're reading something like that, well, yeah, it makes sense. And as you see, like lower into it, they were kind of put at a disadvantage because of the fact that their a line item for their budget was actually vetoed. Mm -hmm. And they even said that they've tried to have the PRC organize, you know, as a department has tried to have conversations with the governor and it's not fair that the governor is not opening her door to her necessarily. You know, and I can't say if whether or not Governor um, Lujan Grisham is using this as an opportunity to genuinely change the department. But what I have noticed in her administration is that if there's inefficiencies or definitely disagreements with some of the policies and, and, and the types of procedures or changes that she's trying to make in administration, it's very obvious for, to, for us to point fingers and say, she doesn't agree, disagree, she doesn't agree with them. So they're getting the can. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, you know, it's a really, it's a really terrible situation. It obviously can create problems. Uh, it can be very problematic for us as New Mexicans, but at the same time, I don't know if the constitutional amendment is going to change, but something's got to change. If, if people are constantly taking the PRC as a conversation of things are not working in the best interest of New Mexicans and things are stalling. Mm -hmm. A perfect example is like the Zia Trust, uh, the Zia Trust um, energy line. Um, we couldn't get clearance from the PRC and the economic impact of that was definitely in the, um, I want to say 150 to $200 million for the PRC. So it couldn't get it passed. Like you said, Justine, earlier in our conversation before it, they don't necessarily have a, a figure um, to run the PRC. There is no elected official that runs the PRC. Mm -hmm. um, so it's government inefficiency that's costing, obviously, taxpayers the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously <clears throat> now it's they can't find a building. But hey, whenever there's lemons, <laughs> you make lemonade. So I'm sure the PRC will figure it out. I, I, I find it hard to believe that General Services Department doesn't have space. I just... Uh, you watch, you give that a couple of weeks, that'll turn around quick. Justine, let me, let me ask you this. You brought this up brilliantly as we started this. Even if the constitutional amendment passes, it won't be until 2023 until the governor can appoint three seats on the PRC. So, I mean, don't we have to figure out a way to make this work until then? I mean, 2023 is a bit of time away here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think every good executive at any level, mayors of Albuquerque, governors of New Mexico, you know, um, have figured out you just have to have basic functions of government work or people are going to turn against you. And, mm. you know, once people is start- there a, Is there a danger out, here up for the sure. governor on this? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're gonna start to see happening on a, on a sort of micro level is cases are gonna be settled um, often to the detriment of consumers because it's just too hard. It's too hard to convene a meeting. It's too hard to deal with hard problems and get folks together and there's going to be much less sunshine and scrutiny on what the PRC is doing. Um, and so there are going to be interest groups who are very dissatisfied with that uh, and, and basic things, you know, this is a licensing entity. People aren't going to be able to get stuff done. So this has sort of all the pettiness and retaliation, uh, you know, that we saw sometimes with governor Richardson. Some people may say also with governor Martinez, but none of the strategy, I mean, this is just not the fight to pick. There's, it's not a winner for her. She's got to keep this place working. 
and and it's bad for consumers it's bad for the the utilities it's bad for everybody mm -hmm. if it doesn't work i i yeah i just to quickly comment on it Please. though again like from a distance not knowing all the details of the prc and being very um, aware of the fact of, of of the ignorance level i might be portraying on this one but it sounds like the PRC has obviously been very dysfunctional for the last several years. And this situation is pretty much the icing on the cake. So even if this situation had happened under the Governor Martinez administration, at this point, it's just it has to be a wake up call that the PRC has got to get its stuff together. There's no doubt about yeah, it. Fair enough. I mean, no more dysfunctional than many other state agencies. Still does a lot of important work. And I mean, that's true. And some people believe the constitutional amendment will change that. I think you can have a, a substantive educated conversation about whether or not the commissioners should be elected but you can't you cannot take the position that they shouldn't have an office and they shouldn't be able to meet and they shouldn't be able to have hearings <laughs> that's a very good point there well said Serge do we put too much into the past discretions of the PRC do we make too much of this we're always joking about E. Shirley Baca Jerome Block Jr. I mean every state agency has its you know <laughs> people that do crazy things. Do we, do we pick on the PRC too much here? Um, you know, I, I have never thought of it in that way of poor PRC getting picked on. I mean, I think you're not wrong that any sort of agency, any organization is gonna have moments that it wish were not uh, quite so public and people were not paying attention to. But, um, you know, if, 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 uh, these things keep coming to the fore, then, you know, obviously they're gonna get folks attention. So uh, while I'm, I, I'm aware that, you know, maybe on this show, we talk about the PRC more than your average New Mexican does uh, in casual conversation uh, and, and they, get, they do get a lot of attention. I don't think that it's necessarily, you know, they're being picked on or more so than any other agency. They're, they are very, you know, they're involved in all of our lives and, uh, mm -hmm. and should be paid attention to. So I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about them getting. Yeah, up. they're big boys and girls. They can handle it. Crystal, I got one last question. I got about a minute on this. It, it, are we seeing a harder edge to the governor than we realized? Maybe she has all along. I mean, she, this is a tough, tough stance. Is is she tougher on these things that we've maybe come to think of her up to this point? I think the public's finally seeing it in the limelight. And of course, um, you know, when you go in the roundhouse now, you know, pre-session or like during the session, et cetera. And they're seeing that there's a person, and I've talked about this in, in multiple different ways, like our governor is a bulldog and, and not only is she a bulldog, I mean that in the utmost respect possible where if there's problems with leadership, there needs to be change. If there, there's problems with execution, there needs to be change. Any good leader is gonna look at these principles of leadership and make changes to, make, to, to be effective and no matter what type of, um, if it's a government, if it's business, et cetera. So I think this is the first time that we're actually seeing something, though we can't necessarily pinpoint if this was a political move because she didn't get what she wanted from the PRC. Let's just be, let's, uh, if we were to say fair and balanced on that particular mm -hmm. subject. But I think it's a perfect example of um, dissatisfaction and action being taken towards the dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. There you go. We'll have to leave that there. When this group returns, we're talking about Brian Erlocker's falling out with his college football team and how it typifies the tough conversations being had across the country. You love something, you will take care of it and you will nurture it and you will fight for it. And if you can kind of key in to that, that, that that's a way to, to keep moving forward on these issues that are super overwhelming. Labor Day weekend is an important milestone in New Mexico's fight against COVID-19. At the beginning of the summer, the state had only recently reopened outdoor dining when Memorial Day weekend came around. Pent-up New Mexicans headed to restaurants, parks, and other public spaces in droves. And soon after, COVID cases spiked. That's what Human Services Department Secretary Dr. David Scrace and the pandemic response team were trying to avoid. His NYF producer, Matt Grubbs, with more. Dr. David Scrace, we appreciate your time this morning. Um, we've arrived at Labor Day weekend, and we know that holidays haven't necessarily been good for what you're trying to do, which is stop people from getting and spreading COVID-19. Do you think Labor Day is going to be different? Uh, you know, I, a great question, and I think my answer is it depends on choices that we all as New Mexicans make for the holiday. Uh, you know, one uh, 
one of my mentors once said to me, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. And I think hopefully we've garnered some experience about what happens in New Mexico with large gatherings and uh, on holiday weekends. You know, families have a hard time staying apart on holidays. We get that. Uh, you know, people drive in from all over, I mean, sometimes other states to celebrate and have a big party. But as I don't really like to say, you know, there are just some things that we have to give up for a year and big family gatherings, probably going to be one of them. Uh, now, people you live with, and now with a limit of 10, there's probably room for a few small guests. But in general, we really need to keep those groups small and follow the other social distancing guidelines that I think will uh, help us to uh, keep that spread down over this Labor Day weekend. The other thing that's really important that I want to emphasize is we are reopening schools and, and we, that's really important. That's a big investment. And I can't think of a better time to stay home with a small group of people like the ones you live with for your Labor Day barbecue uh, than now, because we simply don't want to tip over that apple cart and cause our communities to be unsafe for kids to return to school. Sure, there seems to be a lot that's stacking up right now, as you said, with holidays and kids um, getting back. You spend what seems to be a, a fair amount of time, along with your medical team, um, synthesizing studies on COVID-19. Um, as we go into this next month, what, what has your eye? You know, I think what's had my eye and all my time this past week is working with uh, Ryan Stewart, the Secretary of Education, on the detailed planning of return to school. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of decisions to be made. And some of them are super easy, like, yeah, everybody has to wear a mask. But then some of them are really hard, like, what about kids uh, due to medical diagnoses or a variety of limitations simply can't wear a mask? And what's our approach going to be to that? I wouldn't have thought that lunchtime would be an area that I would have spent eight hours on this past week, but you know, that's a big risk. It's, it's kids inside um, with out masks on for a period of time for lunch. You know, one thing we've learned about this through the help of our partners at Los Alamos National Lab is cohorting is a really, really big deal. So safely reopening schools, you want those kids in that class to be with each other and no one else. So hallways. And so there's a lot of detailed discussions. My, uh, my heart goes out to Secretary Stewart because in addition to the ones that have some medical connection, he's got thousands of other little details he's working through as well. So I think parents <clears throat> keeping their home safe through Labor Day weekend will keep our community safe through Labor Day weekend, which will reduce the likelihood that our K through five or six graders will be bringing COVID into the schools, same for teachers, them staying safe, reduces that likelihood. I think if anybody can do it, New Mexico can do it. We've got a good shot at successfully reopening schools. Our numbers are where they need to be. Our numbers are where they need to be. And, you know, everybody's reading about states where there were disasters like Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama and Oklahoma and Indiana. All of those folks were experiencing case counts one and a half to four times higher than New Mexico. If they'd had our gating criteria, they never would have opened. So I think we're in a good place, but let's preserve that position uh, being poised for success by safe Labor Day weekend practices. In those meetings uh, with your team and with Secretary Stewart, I'm sure there's someone who says, it's really important for parents to be able to get kids back into school, not just for kids, uh, but for parents as well. Um, are those conversations taking place and then how does that fit into it? Absolutely. I mean, I think I've been saying all along and we've been saying that we have to learn to live in a COVID positive world. And that includes balancing control of the disease and life as best as we possibly can with things like school and businesses and all. Unfortunately, you know, we normally function up here, but the disease has brought us way down. We want to try to find that exact balance, but hey, I got a teenager. Uh, <clears throat> Chad Smelzer, our lead epidemiologist, has a couple teenagers, so we're personally aware 
of the value of children returning to school. I'm completely convinced by the educational research that shows that in-person learning is better. And what we're doing here is really just taking baby steps, starting with uh, the elementary school age kids whom our modeling say pose the least risk, half time in school, and then further expanding beyond that. People uh, have been bugging me a lot lately, like what could be the possible difference between high school students and elementary school students? And you know, they're all kids, how can you say they're different? Well, the answer is that elementary school kids go to school and they come home and they have, at least in these times, very limited interactions with other people outside their classroom cohort and their family. Middle school students may be more likely to gather in a place they can walk to. And, and I think we bumped up their interactive, you know, index by 10 or 15%, but high school, you know, 20 to 30% higher number of interactions outside of school. And so there really is science behind this. It's true that we're trying to predict the future, but I think, you know, we're basically trying to figure out what's gonna happen two to four weeks from now. Other states are just doing stuff and then waiting four weeks to see what happens. So I like to think we're six to eight weeks ahead of what other states are doing and using our analytic skills and tremendous partners across the state. Presbyterian's been a gem as well to, to give us a better idea of what to expect. Sure, you've talked previously about not getting rattled by a couple of days of case counts in the high hundreds or two hundreds um, and how positivity rate can better inform us. Can you spend just a, a moment explaining how those two things fit together? Yeah, let me, uh, let me take you really briefly, if that's okay, to, the, uh, to our website. I've just decided uh, it's easier than making the slides all the time. But sure. here's our, our website and actually uh, it starts at the opening page. If you just Google this or any version of this, you'll get right to this page. And then you can see we have four categories. How is COVID spreading? How are we doing with testing? How's our contact tracing doing? Uh, what about our statewide healthcare system capacity? How are they doing? And everything is looking good. Last week, we only had one measure out of line uh, was the getting people into quarantine. And uh, this is late breaking news, but you're the first to hear it. But that one also is in line this week. And we're sort of meeting all eight of the measures for our four categories. Uh, but what we're finding is this daily cases is an important new addition. We can measure that by uh, for the whole state, which we have here. And these are familiar to your viewers and listeners, these various peaks, but we're now down in a really good range and where we do have room to actually reopen. And then the case positivity rate, uh, I'm gonna go to next. Uh, we're one of the best in the country. And I think you've heard me say recently that if you want to find a state that's doing better than New Mexico, you won't find it going west of us. And you have to go all the way to West Virginia to find a state that's doing better than us east of us. It's them and the, and the New England states. So this test positivity where lower is better uh, is doing great. And our tests, even though they've come down a little bit, this is due to a number of changes, including more focused testing on counties where we're seeing higher case counts and higher test positivity rates, which as you know, are gonna uh, uh, be used to inform decisions about returning to school. And then the other thing you said is really important. I, we get a lot, I get a lot of emails about <clears throat> case counts per day, each day. And I send them back saying, you know, I don't really look at those. Try to focus on seven day rolling averages. It gives you a much better sense of trend. We know that case counts are, uh, are gonna be lower after, uh, after the weekends when less testing occurs on weekends, you know? And so this rolling average smooths that out and give us, keeps us from overreacting or underreacting to a single, uh, data point from a single day. That being said, we're seeing really nice low uh, case rates, even some double digits instead of triple digit rates recently. And I think that makes me feel comfortable and our epidemiologists feel comfortable that we do have room for the school reopening here. Um, we're heading into fall allergy season and flu season. 
symptomatically, those are both things that can look like COVID-19. Is it going to get harder to tell who has or might have COVID-19? Yeah, I think on the allergy side, I have allergies. And so I'm familiar with, you know, itchy eyes is a little bit more consistent with allergies, you know, dry, itchy skin. But other, and of course, you don't get fever with any allergies. Allergies. You can get a cough if you have asthma. Uh, so as a clinician, those are the things I look at. But flu and you know influenza and coronavirus, I think are going to be very difficult to differentiate. I know when talking to our laboratory partners and our state lab, they're looking at adding COVID in in some fashion to the standard respiratory panel you and I would get if we went to an urgent care complaining of uh, respiratory symptoms. So uh, hopefully they'll be testing for influenza A and B and, and haemophilus influenza, which is something different and other kind of viruses, adenovirus, and then, and then coronavirus as well. So they're working out the details on that and whether they'll do it all in one block or whether it'll be sequential, but we have to build that in in order to know what's going on this fall. Uh, the and as, as the opportunity to give another free commercial, please get your flu, flu vaccine. Uh, that was my next question. opportunity to give a free commercial. Please get your flu vaccine in September, now or in October, because that will help us. Uh, and it, I would imagine it would help you, um, the individual who's getting the flu vaccine as well. And that really was my, my next question was that that's the difference, right, between COVID-19 and the flu is that we have a vaccine for seasonal flu. Um, can you spend a moment um, going over some territory that you've gone over before, I'm sure, which is the flu vaccine and is it safe? The flu vaccine is, has been shown to be a, a highly effective in preventing influenza and by highly, people are hearing 100%, but it's more like 60 to 70% in most years. Uh, we start with Australia in the Southern Hemisphere and other Southern Hemisphere countries to predict what strains of the flu will be spreading across the world. Uh, generally, manufacturers pick the top three of those and build them into a vaccine. Sometimes they're correct. Mostly they're correct. Sometimes they're wrong. I actually isolated a new influenza virus when I was a primary care practitioner in Ann Arbor. It's called, it was called influenza Ann Arbor, I washed it out of someone's nose. Our laboratory isolated it as a new strain and it actually was named influenza Ann Arbor and it ended up being in a vaccine a couple uh, years hence. If you Google it, you won't find my vital role in washing that person's <laughs> nose out. But I like to, I like to brag about that uh, when I can't think of anything else to talk about. Uh, but so I get the vaccine every year. Healthcare workers are required to get the vaccine like COVID, you can spread influenza for 48 hours before you have any symptoms at all, which is why healthcare workers are generally required to have it. Uh, I think a lot of delivery systems will say either you have to get the vaccine or you have to wear a mask from you know November through March. And so very high uptake in healthcare workers. And I think that's a good barometer. I think if healthcare workers, anything that healthcare workers are willing to do in high numbers should be a signal to the general public that this is uh, safe and effective. Now, people could argue, well, yeah, but they, healthcare workers are getting it because they have to for their jobs, but also healthcare workers go into healthcare to help other people and they are very conscious about their responsibility to not spread disease. So I think that the we have not had a major problem with serious side effects in large numbers with a, back, a flu vaccine in many, many years, and would encourage all your listeners to, to, uh, uh, to get that vaccine. And last question for you, is part of the difficulty with COVID-19 and getting people to understand it that they can't see it so much unless they've had a personal experience with it? Um, they don't see what the healthcare providers see. Yeah, you know, it's one of the shocks to me as a physician and a scientist working in government and as the election approaches, and maybe it's, maybe it's not a, well, it was a little bit of a shock at first, more of a disappointment is that we've kind of let some of these basic science issues become politicized. I, th I think we're over the 
do masks work or not, uh, you know, controversy in general, although there's still a lot of people who don't wear masks. And, um, and I'm kind of hoping that one thing we can all come together on is when we have evidence that shows something's effective or helpful or like we do with masks and reducing spread, like we know about gatherings, like we also know about travel. We know 18, 20% of our cases in New Mexico are in somewhere or another related to travel across state lines, whether it's us going out and coming back or other folks coming in. Um, I think those things are more what I would call facts and not opinions. So the more we can use those to inform our personal decisions, uh, the better. Excellent. Dr. Grace, we appreciate your time. Take care. You have a good day. Brian Urlacher's place among local legends is secure, but the former linebacker and NFL Hall of Famer drew scorn from current football players for his comments regarding the shooting of Jacob Blake. Last week, Mr. Urlacher criticized NBA players for their symbolic walkout to protest the shooting by police of the black man in Kenosha, Wisconsin, saying the fellow Hall of Famer Brett Favre played a game the day his dad died. Current Lobo players ex- were not happy with Mr. Urlacher in a lengthy statement. And Crystal, there's a risk to sticking your neck out as an athlete, certainly. You know, we all get that. But what did you make of Mr. Urlacher's statement, his actual words? You know, everybody's absolutely entitled to their own opinion. And I just have to preface that by saying that personally, I was very disappointed in Bright Urlacher for saying something like that, especially since so many people look at him as not only one of the best defensive um, defensive players in the NFL, a Hall of Famer, a Lobo alumni, and add to the list of accolades that he has. Mm -hmm. As a public figure, there's very much a responsibility to make sure that we're influencing society in, in in a very positive way. So of course people were listening to his statement. And quite honestly, even though you might call Brett Favre one of the best quarterbacks in the world, the putting the similarities between the two of walkouts versus somebody playing a game when somebody dies is absolutely absurd and different, absolutely different because you know, I look at, uh, I'm, I'm a recent golfer, right? And I look at Cameron Champ. He was the only golf athlete that made a significant impact in his statement by, by not only being a, a multiracial um, adult, but he had a black shoe and a white shoe. And something as small as that made waves in the PGA because it goes to show that actions should, should be taken. And remember that black lives absolutely matter. This is a time in our society where everybody's reconsidering the way that they're thinking about race for the better. And if Brian's not going to be a part of that society where where we want to rethink race, his statement obviously showed that he wasn't on that on that train and he wasn't part of that team. And that's his prerogative. However, UNM students speaking out and UNM not doing enough to support those students that that disagreed with UNM. Um, I think speaks miles uh, and I really recommend, I, I re- really commend the student athletes for quiet, for silently protesting, making a difference, knowing that their scholarships could have been um, on the line because of the fact that they spoke their mind. I'm really proud of the students and I'm, I'm a proud of the AD and the, and the basketball and, and the, and the coaches for, for, for gathering with those students, because that shows more action of change than Brian Urlacher, uh, Brian Urlacher's message on social media. Mm-hmm. Serge, let me do this to you. Let me read his full quote to you. I think for folks who may not know how incendiary this quote is, it, it's probably good to hear this for context. Quote, Brett Favre played the Monday night football game the day his dad died through four TDs in the first half and was a legend for playing in the face of adversity. NBA players boycott the playoffs because a dude reaching for a knife wanted on a felony, a sexual assault warrant was shot by police, end quote. That's, that's an amazing quote when you really think about it. The back half of that is really quite something. What's, what's your reaction to that, Serge? Oh, I, I, well, first it was just to be dismissive, right? And to, to not really give much weight to what is, you know, not, not a very well thought out and well supported uh, statement. But I'm also, you know, it's, it's depressing to think, to see that, folks are trying to recast what the, the NBA player's message as, you know, we're not tough enough to play or, the, or something along those lines. And what, as well as sort of a willful distortion of the motivations behind that, right? And sort of, sort of 
shrugging off all of the, the Black Lives Matter, all of the, the protests against police action and all of the, 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 the conversation that's been you know, going on for ages and building for, over the course of the summer. Um, so I was you know, disappointed uh, by, by that, as well as this notion that, you know, that, that Brian or Locker or anyone else gets to decide when the NBA players are allowed to use their platform to make to to send the message that they want to send, right? I was, you know, um, other folks talking about oh these highly paid athletes trying to take the night off, right? Right. So I'm not sure what income bracket is allowed to protest, um, but I was really I was disappointed by the whole tenor of that conversation and um, that was critical and almost willfully misunderstanding the actions of athletes who were using their position to try to draw attention to important issues that they, you know, to them and to their communities. Yeah, and it's, an impo- Locker- it's an important point you just made there. I mean, when you think about it, this man is a 13 year NFL veteran. They're in a locker room with probably majority black players in that locker room, most of those 13 years. How he could cop this attitude after being around so many African-American players for 13 years is just, it's amazing. Uh, Justine, let me read you the quote from UNM. This is interesting and and probably important for context uh, for all of us and for viewers as well. Here's the quote from UNM. Regardless of who you are or your relation to this football team, we will no longer tolerate hatred and blatant ignorance directed towards the very existence of so many on this team. We will always stand unified and we will march far across the river towards justice together. A little flowery at the end of there, but the, uh, the points made, is that enough in your gut, Justine, from what you heard from UNM to push back against the Earl Locker statement? Yeah, and you know, one of the other things that the UNM student athletes said in their full statement, which I found very, rang very true and is very striking is, like Brian Urlacher, we won't always be actively playing. You know, our careers will end, but some of us will always be black. And, right. you know, I think Brian Urlacher needs to understand this isn't Lovington in the 90s. You know, it's not even, this isn't Kaepernick in 2016. This is a different moment. Look at how fast the Bears distance right. themselves That's right. from this, this hometown hero. Um, he is tone deaf to, to the max. And I think, um, as Serge said, you know, it's, it's not a new thing for athletes, um, for celebrities of all stripes to use their position, to use their wealth, to use their prestige and, and, and try, to, try to make social change. Um, but what's new and what really is a threat in this election and a threat to the status quo is to see players like LeBron James, to see players um, who who maybe were not, you know, like Jordan, who, who, who took a lot of flack because they didn't come out earlier, mm-hmm. coming together, having a real conversation about where we are as a country and, and saying, we're not going to stand for this. And, you know, this isn't, this isn't the 1960s when black athletes were just to stand back and not speak. Um, and, and Urlacher needs to get that. And, right. and so I think it's a threat. Um, I think, you know, Urlacher is a supporter of Trump. He had just been in the White House with his family. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's out there stumping. His statement is as political as any. That's right. um, and it, it's a real threat to have athletes out there saying, no, this time we, we want real change. You know, this isn't, we've been through 1968 in Mexico City. You know, we've been through Jesse Owens in 1936, four gold yep. medals, doesn't get to shake hands at the White House. Okay, this is a different moment. Good stuff there. Crystal, you know, when you think about it, he was also caught liking a, uh, uh, a post in support of Mr. Rittenhouse, the young man that shot and killed uh, those folks in, in, in Kenosha, uh, that one person in Kenosha, which is interesting. New Lobo coach Danny Gonzalez told the journal, though, um, that he's reached out to Urlacher to speak to the team. Is that a smart move? I, if, uh, I, I actually feel that uh, Coach Gonzalez has um, shown an, uh, examples of leadership in positive ways. And if Coach Gonzalez's intention was to create conversations where there could actually be a healthy, productive debate about race and equality, mm-hmm. I think that is absolutely the best move possible because the best thing to do to, to 
to create a plan to move forward and, and to change people's minds is not to actually turn your shoulder away from the conflict, but actually to, to, to deal with it face on. So I, I know that Coach Gonzalez had every intention to bridge um, an opportunity to talk to Erlacher even before the situation happened. But I think he's, he's truly showing that the athletes, rather than running away from a conversation or using your PR person to make a statement, you should absolutely, absolutely have a meaningful conversation with the source itself. Mm-hmm. So I think it was a really great move. I don't know the true intention of why he might have asked for this meeting, though. So I can't say that's going to happen. But the guy's got good leader. The, the guy's a good coach, and the guy knows to make sure that you're not only good on the on the field and good on your strategy, but good in the locker room and good in school. So and there is there, can evolve go ahead. in thinking. I mean, anybody can evolve in their thinking. I think it's mm-hmm. a healthy conversation. That's a good point. That's I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. All right, we're out of time on that one. Next, Laura Pascas on her new book called At the Precipice. And I have correspondent Laura Pascas has spent most of her professional life reporting on our state's environment. It's been at times frustrating and at other points inspiring. In her new book, At the Precipice, she reflects on that journey and lays out the key parts of New Mexico's fragile place in a warming natural world. And I have producer Matt Grubb sat down to speak with her about the story she's told and the ones she's still telling. Laura Pascas, it's good to see you without a mask on, 10 feet away. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Hey. Um, what strikes me about your book is that, one, we've known about this for so long, um, and two, that you do an excellent job of getting into some of the human stuff. So let's, let's first start with um, some of the work that you've done over the course of the couple decades that you've been covering this. Um, you found people who've been warning about this, um, who've been talking about it at varying degrees of, of volume for years. Uh, what has changed? I think the big thing that has changed is more and more people understand that the climate is changing and that's going to have negative impacts on communities and landscapes and resources here in New Mexico. And even though there is still a partisan divide on climate change and the understanding that it's human caused. There, in New Mexico, the numbers really do show that the majority of New Mexicans understand that climate change is happening, understand it will have negative impacts, and understand that it's human caused. So that's definitely changed throughout the course of my reporting career. Okay. The, the sort of the subtitle is New Mexico's Changing Climate, but you do a good job of sort of bringing it into a global, a global focus too. One of the things um, that I noticed and that you emphasize is that we're seeing climate change now. It's happening in um, a lot of the stuff uh, that, for example, we see on our land every month, but um, snowpack, fire season, uh, it's, it's in our face, it sounds like. It really is here in New Mexico. I feel like New Mexicans and maybe people in other states feel this way about their state, but in New Mexico, I feel like we really have a close connection with our landscapes. We pay attention to our seasons. Um, New Mexicans understand what's happening around them. And so whether it's a longer fire season or big fires with pretty troubling floods afterwards or the dry Rio Grande, Um, We see these impacts all over the place, but they've been happening all over the world for a while now. Um, In the book, I touch a little bit on what was was happening even 10 years ago in the Pacific, where you have islands that are being inundated by oceans and people asking for help and asking why Americans aren't paying attention to climate change and aren't taking action on climate change. So we see the impacts all across the globe. Uh, we see them kind of slowly, or, or at least we were, right? It was sort of this slow motion crash uh, that is now manifesting itself um, to the point where it sounds like we used to say, wow, it's been like a hot stretch, you know, or we had a great winter or something like that. And now um, we kind of know what we can pin to climate change, at least more, it sounds like. Yeah, and this year is a really interesting year for New Mexico, I think, for us to be paying attention to because 
you know, the Rio Grande dries pretty regularly as we've seen diminished snowpack and as we choose to use the river's water for other uh, uses. Um, but this year is really interesting because the river started to dry at the end of May, early June. And right now there's about 40 miles dry of the middle Rio Grande. But this year's snowpack wasn't super bad. It was close to normal from the fall through February. And yet we still saw a reduced snowpack and um, an early snow melt. So for places like the arid southwest, warming means drying. And so even if we have close to normal precipitation, this warming that we're seeing is, is having such big impacts on our water resources, on our rivers, and on our ability to, to rely on surface water. You spend a fair amount of time talking about this concept that Jonathan Overpeck has of a hot drought, um, that it's a drought more reliant on temperature than it is on precipitation. Is that kind of what you're, what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly, where even when we have a good snowpack, um, that melts out early and fast. Or um, we have close to normal precipitation, but that comes in rain instead of snow. So there's, there's all kinds of issues involved with that hot drought, including that the warmer it is, the more plants need water, the faster your soils dry out, the harder it is to recover when there is precipitation. So this hot drought is a really important um, concept for New Mexicans to understand. The, you talk um, uh, about a guy named Greg Garfin, um, who has, has been, who is a scientist. One of the things um, you quote him as saying is, the big message for me is the interconnectedness between all these systems. Uh, if we try to look at those in isolation, we're setting ourselves up for more problems. So um, the idea that we're getting rain instead of snow has all these sort of far-flung impacts and, and it's all connected. It is, and as the climate has changed, you know, we're still relying on a water infrastructure that was entirely set up to, for a snow melt system. You know, our big reservoirs, um, when water is delivered, um, all of these systems are becoming outdated. And so that's a big, you know, we kind of need to catch up politically, socially, and in terms of our, our technical and engineering efforts, we need to be, start trying to catch up with the climate. We're much better at that, but you're talking about um, added up together probably multi-billion dollar systems. I mean, the cost to build a dam or even a water control system is, is almost mind-boggling now. Yeah, so wouldn't it have been great if we started planning for this? you know, 20 years ago when we had a really good idea of what was happening or even back in the 1960s when there was some pretty solid consensus building around the fact that the climate was changing. Instead, we have just continued to kick decisions down the road and they get more expensive and harder to implement. And certainly right now we have so many different crises to focus on that I, I worry that the climate crisis, which is becoming more and more pronounced, will just kind of get pushed aside once again. As you read through the book, as I read through the book, um, like I said, the human part of it comes up so often. And when you talk about the systems um, not working, it's not just climatic, it's human. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think that does to our sense of, of place and of history these traditions that, that we have in the place that we live. Yeah, one of the things, like I mentioned before, I really feel like as New Mexicans, we're very closely connected to our places. And as those places change, whether it's conifer forests in the Jemez that are um, you know, either burning off or dying off, um, or our dry riverbeds, we, we start seeing things like a dry riverbed as normal. And, and stop thinking that that's something that, sh that is and should be alarming and that we should really be, as a society, thinking about how we ensure that doesn't happen. But I think one of the dangers in writing about climate change, and I definitely have felt this at different times in my reporting career, it's really easy to become discouraged and it's really easy to think, 
the forests are dying and I feel sad and why should I care about this landscape anymore? And I think that as all these changes are happening, I don't think we should accept, for example, a dry riverbed as something that's normal and something that we should just accept. But I do think we need to be building new relationships with the landscapes as they change so that we're not just grief stricken or so we don't just feel despair and lean toward inaction, but kind of embracing, embracing change as something that's inevitable. And gosh, it would have been great if we had limited our greenhouse gas emissions decades ago, but this change is happening and we have to, um, we have to adapt to it. You have a couple of really good chapters in the, in the middle of this book about the loss of your father and about how the faith community is responding to it. How did you start to make sense of um, grief and, and kind of the parallel pathways or channels of grief with the loss of your father? I think it's really easy to, uh, I think it's really easy to be sad sometimes and it's really easy to be angry. And especially when you're thinking about environmental issues, it's really easy to feel angry about things that you see happening that you think are unjust or unfair. And that anger can propel you forward um, toward action, but after a while it's exhausting and after a while it eats you up and you know, kind of makes you um, act in other ways of your life that maybe aren't great or healthy. And so I think one of the really important lessons that I learned is that if you love something, you will take care of it and you will nurture it and you will fight for it. And if you can kind of key in to that, that, that that's a way to, to keep moving forward on these issues that are super overwhelming. Sure, sure. Um, we, are, as a country right now, are dealing with sort of one of the, another one of these long issues of, of race and racial injustice. Um, the faith community is tied into, I think, both of these movements. How did you see um, churches and centers of faith responding to this? You talk about it a little bit as sort of a, almost a moral issue, much like racial justice would be. Yeah, I was able to talk with some really great faith leaders in New Mexico when, um, when reporting on climate change, and especially um, back a few years ago when Pope Francis issued his encyclical calling for action on climate change. And it was around also a really important international meeting that the timing sort of was corresponded. And um, there were so many people, not just Catholics, but people across faith coming together to say, um, we're caretakers of the earth, we're caretakers of one another, and we should be taking care of this issue of climate change and also recognizing that climate change impacts vulnerable communities first and, and most deeply. And so it is a social justice issue, it's a moral issue, and it's, it's an issue that so many different communities of faith have, have said, We're all, we all want to be working on this together. Have they reached out to um, native communities whom you describe in the book as, well, I don't know if you use these words, but the, I get the picture of them being sort of on the edge. You know, They're in the places where the sea level is rising or out in the Navajo Nation where they don't have running water and it's only getting more dry. Um, is there a connection between those, those communities? Yeah, and I think um, in covering sort of impacts of oil and gas drilling in northwestern New Mexico. There was a woman I had interviewed who talked about how, um, you know, the U.S. government wanted all these good lands and put people, put native communities out on these sort of inferior lands in many instances, like with the Navajo Nation kind of pushed people out there. And then once, oh my gosh, there's oil, there's uranium, there's natural gas, there's coal. You know, we want to extract all of that. And so you have people in these communities who are dealing with the, the daily public health and environmental impacts of an extractive industry. And these are also among the areas that are hardest hit by climate change because of this hot drought, because of this um, move of this arid land to being even warmer and drier. So you have many native communities bearing a disproportionate impact of the, the impacts of climate change. 
Well, Laura, this is a, a great book, and there's a, a ton more to talk about. I've got all my little pink notes in here, but I look forward to, to many more. And really, thanks for doing this work and for staring at the stuff that's so hard for a lot of us to look at. We appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. It's hard not to think about how many families, couples, friends, and such will not be doing their annual thing this Labor Day weekend, despite an almost built into our DNA need to get out. But I also can't help thinking about how many of us can't resist turning out for that last gasp of summer, a summer that never was in many ways. I can understand the urge to see Labor Day as some sort of make good on the summer that didn't happen for us, but we have a little bit of momentum going for us currently. Let's keep that going. So to stay safe, stay distanced and masked, and we come out of the holiday weekend in great shape. This is doable and we can do it. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.